Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by, by them. 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on the tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one knows it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, <coughs> and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For the inheritance comes by the law. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no longer God. I'm sorry. It is no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So I hope you catch what Paul's saying there. Yeah. God gave the promise to Abraham well before Moses. All right. Yeah. Verse 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary applies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you all are sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there, there is neither Jew nor Greek, nor there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female. For you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So before we even get into all these different, uh, this wonderful passage, I wanted to say that there's several confusing verses in there. There's several confusing thoughts in there. And um, verse 20 is one, you know, there's there's several in there that are kind of just confusing. Um, but I, I want to, before you get your hopes up, I want to let you know that most of the commentaries, a lot, there's a lot of misunderstanding. <laughs> so there's not a lot of clarity out there. All right. So um, I'll do my best. Um, but uh, it is what it is, all right? So, um, so, but before, so we're going to go back up a bit to verses we already covered in the last lesson, but I think you'll see that it's appropriate to do so. And before we begin, we need to define what the law is in Paul's mind in order to really understand what, he, what he's inspired to deal with here. All right, last class we went to, I think we did up to 14. And so we, that's why we started with 11 again because we want to remain in context. So when Paul speaks of the law here in Galatians, he's speaking of all the written expectations given the Jews by God. And so we need to understand what the law is. Sometimes we, we have a misunderstanding what that, what that includes. So this includes both the Ten Commandments as well as the Levitical laws and all the words of instruction and command given in the Pentateuch in Genesis, Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is what the Jewish idea of the law is. Whenever you hear... Uh, the law, they're talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and all the instructions of God to his people therein, all right? So Paul is speaking to Gentiles of Jews here, uh, speaking to Gentiles and Jews here, and their understanding of the law is what he is dealing with, all right? Um, he is not simply dealing with the idea of righteousness through kosher laws. That's not what he's just, that's not the only thing he's dealing with. He's not just dealing with ceremonial laws. 
or moral laws like the Ten Commandments. Paul is speaking of all the law. The law is not the way or even the real measure of righteousness. That is faith. And see, that backwards from how the typical humanity thinks about righteousness. We think, well, if you really want to be right, you got to do. Yeah, yeah. And that's not that's not the biblical idea. In fact, yeah, I was it's, watching. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, they speak the same with like that it's works that take care of everything. Mm -hmm, sure. mm -hmm. It's works that take care of everything. I remember this actually is still my favorite uh, presentation of the Gospels in video form. Um, Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, that's how old is that? It's like thirty years. <laughs> um, but it's excellent, excellent movie and. Um, it is some really cool stories. It was made by uh, a Roman Catholic influence and, and really by a non Christian producer, but people started getting saved on set, you know, just because of the content. Anyway, um, there's a line in that movie where a Pharisee comes and they're talking about the law, and this is extra biblical, but he says, It's how I measure. This person is right and this person is wrong. It's how I judge. This person is right and this person is wrong. And Jesus says, well, you are, who, you are not the judge, you know. And that's really a, you know, kind of a secular blanket statement over the whole whole idea. But the idea that that how we measure is very right. All right. That's how we, we measure if someone's a good person or a bad person. You know, your son brings home a, a girl. Well, what does she do? Does she smoke, drink too? You know, <laughs> you know. Who does he hang out with? You know, that's how we that's how we think, you know, um, but Jesus takes it way deeper than that. It's not just about the external. It's about internal as well. All right. Um, and so Paul is dealing with this. He is speaking of all the law. The law is not the way or even the real measure of righteousness. And that is faith. Verse 11. So now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. So that's that's kind of a, another place of confusion right there. What is Paul talking about? Now, in verse 11, we see Paul quote Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, which says, Behold, his soul is puffed up and is not upright with him, but the righteous shall live by faith or by his faith. That's Habakkuk 2.4. You might want to write that down so you can look it up later. Habakkuk 2.4. Uh, Douglas Moo, who is a, a commentator on, on Galatians and a professor, a scholar, a translator, he's, he points out that this verse is, a, is fascinating. Habakkuk 2.4 is fascinating, and different versions of the Old Testament have different forms of the text and the variations in the pronoun. In the Hebrew, it reads, the righteous by his, the righteous ones, Faithfulness will live. The righteous by his faithfulness will live. Um, in the Greek Old Testament, the first, one Greek version of the Old Testament says, the righteous by my faithfulness will live, meaning God's faithfulness. The righteous by my faithfulness will live. And another version of the Greek Old Testament says, my righteous one by faith or faithfulness will live. Isn't that kind of a neat thing that, that they're, I think is neat. Um, that faith and faithfulness are connected, you know. They're like a connecting thought in the Hebrew and the, and the Greek. That's one thing all three of the Old Testament ancient writings have in mind, is that faithfulness is not connected or not disconnected from faith, all right? Faith and faithfulness are connected in that verse, all right? The righteous self, uh, by his faithfulness will live. The righteous by my faithfulness will live. My righteousness by what? By, my righteous one by faith slash faithfulness will live. All right. Um, so Paul abbreviates, abbreviates it to the one who is righteous by faith will live. Or the one who is righteous will live by faith. Uh, so you cannot be sure what the prepositional phrase uh, modifies in Paul's version. All right. Um, so Paul's use of Habakkuk is to, to remind his readers that just as belonging to Abraham is by faith, so too righteousness is not by law, but by faith. Okay, so let's say that again and read that sentence again. Um, Paul is reminding his readers that belonging to Abraham is by faith. We, we read that, we know that, that it's, um, it's by faith, not circumcision that 
that, that God gave the promise to Abraham. All right. And so you're really connected with Abraham through faith, not by circumcision, which the Judaizers are trying to promote. And so too, so also, you are righteous, just as Abraham was, by faith. Because the law wasn't even given at that time. Okay. So Paul is defeating at every turn the arguments of the Judaizers. To be Abraham's child, you need to be circumcised. No, to be Abraham's child, you need to have faith. To be righteous, you need to keep the law. No, to be righteous, you need to have faith. All right? So, no, um, just a note here. I do, not, I do, though, find it interesting that the translators seem to vacillate, like I said already, between the words faith and faithfulness in Habakkuk. All right? Um, uh, so I think that's worth meditating on and, and studying. Um, I'm not going to tell you the, the, the reason that is or, or try to, you know, give a, give a, a thesis on that. I, I just find it interesting, all right? And it's something we need to meditate on and study some more. So verse 13, Christ redeemed for, for uh, I'm sorry, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. I think I skipped past 12 there. 12 says, but the, the law is not a faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Um, yeah, we just covered that whole thing. <laughs> anyway, 13, 13, Christ redeem us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Here we see Paul referring to the truth of Christ's substitutionary atonement for mankind. For God so loved the world that he sent his son, that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have eternal life. But Paul here and elsewhere explains that saving faith is possible because of the work accomplished by the finished work of the sacrifice of the lamb. So, so some verses you want to write down for your uh, later uh, research is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. 1 Peter 2, 24. And Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 5. Just we'll look, we'll take a look at that last one, Isaiah 53, 5. Someone have that? Want to read that for us? What was it again? Isaiah 53, 5. So he was pierced for our transgressions, he was cursed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Okay. Um, anyone else have another version? Yeah. Go ahead. No, King James. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Okay, we should actually go on to verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yes. So it's actually verse 6 that is your reference there. As, um, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's 2 Corinthians 5.21. Who knows what that says? For you should, this is the one you should have memorized. Oh, yeah. For he, sin. Yes. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. That really is Galatians summed up. <laughs> it's a wonderful verse. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. All right. And so now Paul is citing here. He is citing in that cursed is everyone who is hanging on a tree. He is citing Deuteronomy 20, 21, 23, but he's doing so kind of loosely. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, and if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is Put to death, and you hang him on a tree. His body shall shall not remain on the tree all night, or his body shall not re yeah remain all night on the tree. But you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. All right. So what is happening here is different from crucifixion. What is happening in Deuteronomy is slightly different. The practice of the Greeks and other pagan societies was was. Uh, is what's going on here, uh, and, and it's happening in, in uh, Jewish society as well. They would execute a criminal and then display his corpse on a pole, all right? And so God is dealing with that practice. And so this is, um, this is not the same as the cross. Um, neither is the word tree, which is the word here in Hebrew. 
but translators don't think that to think the word is talking about a piece of print. I'm sorry, translators think that the word here is talking about a piece of dead wood used to display a corpse. All right. And uh, there's just some, some uh, struggle in the translators with this reference here. So regardless, um, Paul sees in this verse in Deuteronomy a type of foreshadowing to the cross, all right? Um, critics will say that Paul is incorrect in his citations. A proponents of Paul will maintain that what Paul is doing is pulling truths from throughout scripture to meet the error of, Judea of the Judaizers. And he's pulling from what looks like strange references, right? That Habakkuk was a little weird and then Deuteronomy seems a little strange. Um, but Paul, what Paul is doing is he's trying to meet the arguments of the Judaizers um, and show that that uh, that what they're presenting is false. All right. So I think um, when if you come across those criticisms of Paul and saying that he's really stringing pearls or he's pulling things out of context, I want you to remember the who Paul is. All right. Um, I want you to remember who Paul is. Um, we need to remember the character of Paul. Paul is not one to to twist scriptures out of their context to make a point. All right. Even though it might seem that way. Remember that Paul's education in the scriptures is higher than ours and uh, is higher than the Judaizers, all right? Um, and and it, what about his characters? Paul's the type of man who's like a crooked televangelist who will say anything and twist, twist anything in order to gain power. Thus, his life and death um, and cause of death point to selfishness or selflessness, right? Selflessness. So if, if, if selflessness, then we must assume that Paul is building his case for the good of the Galatians, and that's simply to solidify his power. Also, we must look at education and the upbringing of the apostle. He knows the scriptures, he knows their meaning, and a deeper meaning has come upon the scriptures for Paul as he has encountered the living Christ and has been given revelations. All right. So he has access to a truth that we don't have, all right, uh, or to a deeper level of truth. Um, and Paul is no false teacher, he passes the tests of the fruits. Of the false teacher, <laughs> Paul passes that test um, with flying colors. He's no false teacher, all right? Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. Paul's got none of the fruits of the false teacher, all right? Um, so, uh, and so verse 14. <clears throat> and so I'm sorry if I added confusion there when you would have read through it and had no confusion whatsoever. It just gave me more. Um, so verse 14 says, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So let's, but let's back up a bit and review the verses prior to this in context. All right, I'm going to read that whole section again. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, starting at verse 10. Um, for it is written, cursed be, the, be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not a faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So Paul's point here then is that because justification is by faith and not by obedience to the law, because all obedience to the law by imperfect will be then, by imperfect people will then also be imperfect. Mm -hmm. All right. We talked about this at uh, Summer Games Camp. And I might have explained it already, but I had a bucket full of muck from the pond. Nasty stuff. And uh, I took a rag and I had a stain on my shirt and I took a rag and I said, this rag is my righteousness. Problem with my righteousness is that it has me on it. All right. And so my righteous acts have a bunch of me on it. So if I try to clean myself with my righteous acts, what happens? I just make a bigger smear. All right. Because of all, no matter how you do the law, you still are the one doing them, all right? And so they're all tainted by you. <laughs> and so that's that's the problem. With We all fall short of that. Um, so Paul explains to us that the Jews and indeed all mankind are under the curse of not being able to, to uh, achieve the glory of God, all right? They're not, they're not able to not fall short of the glory of God. And so we cannot escape this curse that we have brought, that we brought upon ourselves. Indeed, we must be rescued. And while we are in a desperate need of rescue, justice must also be satisfied. 
for God is not just. And so Christ rescues us from the curse by becoming the curse for us. And he who knew no sin became sin for us. So the weight of sin, the penalty of sin, the guilt of sin, the filth of sin is applied to he who is innocent and pure. So Paul goes on in verse 15 to give a human example. Brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The, the law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. The Greek word here, translated as offspring and offsprings, is usually translated as seed and seeds. Um, Paul is making the point that the seed singular is Christ. So the access and benefits of the covenant made with Abraham and Christ are only accessible by faith in Christ. All right. Let me read that last sentence again. The access and benefits of the covenant made with Abraham are only accessible by faith in Christ. All right. So faith came prior to the law. The promise uh, to and the covenant with Abraham came by faith. So the later law did not undo it. All right. And we're going to see why that law was, was added. Uh, verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. The inheritance is by God's word and by God's work, not Abraham, not ours. All right. So it was God's promise that gives us the inheritance, um, not what we do to earn it. Um, we are connected to Abraham by faith in God. All right. Um, so verse 19, why then the law? It was added because of transgression. So there's our answer. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. So Paul here foresees the arguments of his opponents. Like a good preacher, he anticipates the pushback from his audience. Uh, well, if it's by faith and faith came first and the law did not undo faith, why then the law? And so Paul's answering that because of transgressions. And so this is a debated point. So some scholars believe that we should be cautious in pointing to Romans to understand Galatians uh, better because Paul is speaking to a different audience with a different point of point in both books. And I say this about Romans because we're going to look at Romans. All right. So um, Paul explains some things in, in Romans here. In Galatians, he is trying to convincingly defeat a heresy of the Judaizers. And Romans, he is sought by many to be writing to unite both Jewish and Gentile Christians under one gospel. I tend to disagree with the concept that we cannot use one to establish the other, since we know from Paul that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That's 2 Timothy, or yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And we know from Peter that Paul's writings are to be considered scripture. That's 2 Peter 3.16. That's kind of neat that there's 3.16s, yeah. right? We, we pay attention to the 3.16s, all right? <laughs> um, so let's look at Romans then to help us understand verse 19 of, of chapter 3 of Galatians. Let's look at Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Right, And then look at Romans 4.15. For the law brings wrath. Where there is law, no law, there is no transgression, no breaking of the law. All right, And so Romans 5.20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So Paul seems to be saying that one of the reasons God gave the law to Israel was to make sin, uh, make Sin, something that was clear to people, to establish an objective, clear standard that people could judge themselves against. All right. In that sense, the law turns sin into transgressions or, or a violation of the law. And that's a quote from Douglas Moo. All right. So transgression was done by breaking a law that one is conscious of, sinning when you know it is sin. All right. Sinning when you know it is sin. All right. Um, this is not to say that 
Mankind doesn't know that what they're doing is wrong. We know, Paul speaks to this in Romans chapter 1, verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So God's attributes are clear. His eternal power, his divine nature, in the things that we, we see around us in all creation, not just the external creation we can see, but also we have been made. And C.S. Lewis talked about that last quarter a lot, that, that we can tell a lot about God by the inner uh, conscience in all mankind. All right. Um, so Paul does not divorce that which, that which is good from God. God is the only good. Therefore, Paul's principle about the nature of God from Romans 1.19 extends to the law of human nature. We know much about God by observing his creation. We also know about God from what we know internally is right and wrong. So as for the law, I'm sorry, I'm going a miles, hundred miles an hour right now, but as for the law, surely God knew that the law would not cause the people to become more obedient. God knows, right? He knows all things. He knew that the law was not going to, oh, I'm going to give them the law. They're going to be perfect. God knows. He knew. All right. Um, he knew that the law would not cause the people to become more obedient or change their nature. Rather, he gives the law to display what they know already to be wrong. All right. To be, in fact, wrong. There are no excuses anymore. All right. They can't say, well, you didn't tell, tell me. You know, you took the car without asking. Well, you didn't tell me I couldn't take the car. You know, that's gone. There's no there's no excuses. So they Now they know what what they already know to be, to be in fact wrong, that now they know it to be sin. All right. They take away any excuse or self-justification. One of the problems with law of any kind, whether it's God's law or mankind's law, is people try to find a little wiggle room. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And so the second half of 19 is a highly confusing statement yep. with, lot, with lots of discussion and much, and, and no concession. concession con, what's that word I'm looking for? Concession. Concession. All right. Um, it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Um, it is thought to some by some to mean that Paul is saying that God didn't even God didn't even give the law. All right, but we know that's not true. Paul is simply describing how the law was given, not making at this point anything substantial about the value of the law. So we want to look at also Deuteronomy thirty-three uh, verse two. Um, if you have your Bibles, please open to that. And then I hear Dennis. But we're gonna we're gonna uh, look at these verses first. So Deuteronomy chapter thirty-three, verse two. He said, "The law came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from the mountain Paran. He came from the ten thousands of the holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand." All right. So the law came from Sinai. So Acts chapter 7, verse 53. You know, there's lots of flipping around. You can look, write these down, look them up later. Acts chapter 7, verse 53. You received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. All right. So in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. All right, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So the ideas of angels bringing the law is a Hebrew tradition, and without without a ton of biblical support, those three verses there um, are are argued about. People are still think that Paul is stringing the pearls here. Um, so, but Paul is speaking to the traditions uh, purposely, most likely because the Gentile circumcision party is promoting and teaching them to Gentiles of Galatia. Um, it's not really a, it's not a, a doctrine to hang our hat on, really. That, you know, did the law, did God give the message to Mary or did Gabriel? You know, Gabriel gave it, but who did it come from? You know, in the end, it came from God. It was the message of God. To, to Mary and then to all humanity. Gabriel wasn't the author of it, all right? Gabriel was just a deliverer, 
So even if the even if um, and so there's a lot of like intertestament uh, testament times where uh, at least this was Doug, Doug, Douglas Moo's idea. What he taught is that in the intertestamentary times uh, there was a development of a Hebrew tradition that that the law came by angels. All right, um, and with these different verses that we looked at, and you can see that Deuteronomy 33. Two is really all that they would have had in, the, in that time. And it's really kind of, it's, it's not something, not a, a verse we want to hang our hat on and say angels brought it. But but we do know that it's it's part of uh, uh, other writings, other Hebrew literature, literature and, and, uh, um, and Paul is talking about that. Well, Dennis, you were going to say something? Uh, I don't think I was, but anyway. Oh, I, I thought I heard something. But <laughs> Verse 20 is, is difficult too, but go ahead, Dennis. Oh, you don't have you don't have to. <laughs> but anyway, we'll, we'll get there. Um so Leviticus chapter 20. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. This is farming in my head, and I don't know if it's right or what. But when I hear the word intermediary, intermediary mm -hmm. I think of Jesus as our intermediary between us and yes. God. Yeah. Like this law. Mm -hmm. Is now I mean that's what the law was, mm -hmm. so they could be in touch with God. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's just a thought I had. So yeah. Um, so it was it was more in touch with God's standard than with God Himself, um, and uh, more more in in touch with understanding their own sin. Um, and so the law the law doesn't doesn't help. You know, in that regard, it just shows them who they are. And so uh, let's look at Leviticus chapter 20, verse 22 through 26. You shall therefore <clears throat> keep all my statutes and all my rules and do them, that the land where you have, where I am bringing you to live may not vomit you out. It's interesting. That's an interesting verse right there. Um, um, we're going to go further, but uh, it says that the land that I'm bringing you to may not vomit you out. We see later on in uh, Second Kings, where when some pagans move into into the land, this happens to them. All right, because and that later on we uh, or in that same story in Second Kings, they're told that this is happening to them. The bears are attacking them. The creatures are killing them because they're not living by the laws of the God of the land. All right, so. Kind of check that out yourself. I don't have a reference to give you. It's in Second Kings somewhere. All right. Um, so, so that's actually what actually happens in that case. And so, you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my rules and do them, that the land where I'm bringing you to live may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the customs of the nations that I am driving before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I detested them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess. A land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourself detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the, uh, the ground crawls, um, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples. You that you should be mine. So it's interesting again about that vomiting verse. Isn't that what actually happened? All right. The people were removed from the land that God promised them. Why? Because they did not keep the law. All right. They did not keep God's command. As we read in verse one of chapter 20, that the Lord speaks these words to Moses to relate to the people. Uh, whether the, whether the Lord speaks to Moses through an angel is not written in Leviticus. But it nevertheless became a traditional belief for the people. And so there may have been an assumption that the Levitical laws were given apart from Sinai were given through some angelic mediator. Um, but of course, God could have spoken to Moses and did without always showing himself to Moses as he did on Sinai. All right. So there's a lack of clarity and much supposition with very little evidence about the second half of 19 through 20. Um, getting into it here won't really help us. <laughs> so I 
boy, I took the easy way out there. So um, getting into <laughs> here won't really help us. So I suggest that you dig into it on your own time if you're really, you're really interested. And to be honest, even the time we have spent on it here, and we have spent on 19, 19 here, won't is not going to drastically affect our faith. So perhaps we should agree with the majority of scholars and recognize that all such discussion is, is just kind of speculative. We don't really know what Paul's referring to or what's going on there. Um, so let me read that again. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offering should, should come to whom the promise has been made and it was put into place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary applies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law uh, had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. So moving on to verse 21 then. Sorry, Dennis, I skipped over 20. Did you, want it, did you have anything you wanted to say on 20? Because it is rather a strange statement. It, it still strikes me as uh, strange, um, but... Uh... I don't think we're going to come up with a, a much clarification on it right now. Go on with the rest of it, I would say. Yeah. Uh, just, so. backing up, just backing up a little bit, though, uh, the whole thing about angels. It, whether you think of angels in there or not, Moses certainly was the intermediary in bringing the law. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's good. Whereas God spoke directly to Abraham, he's speaking to the nation Israel indirectly through Moses. Mm -hmm. So uh, thus, there's at least there's that much of a, a pattern to, that Paul is bringing out here. That, yeah. uh, law is quite as good as the other because it had to be passed along. Yeah. And it'd be interesting to do a study on that word angel too, because we know as we looked at Revelation that angel doesn't always mean like angelic being. It, it, the word is messenger. Um, <sighs> and so... It'd be interesting to look at that and to, and to just do a deeper word study on that on that idea and what's going on here. Um, so Paul, maybe Paul's uh, idea in 20, I'm sorry, Dennis. So maybe Paul's idea in 20 is, is that it's all from God, right? Is that um, the angels are speaking on God's behalf and Moses is relating what God has given him. Go ahead, Dennis. In, in Old Testament passages, uh, the angel of the Lord appearing so often, which we think angel uh, celestial being or something but uh, very often it turns out this is just another way of saying god himself yeah, yeah. and some people say well the angel of the lord that's the pre-incarnate christ appearing well okay one way or the other um it's uh, yeah yeah anyway yeah. It's an interesting interesting way to spend years, years. <laughs> studying what angel means but anyway verse 22 to 23 but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So the law made it clear that we are imprisoned to our sinful nature. We are stuck and cannot get out. All right. We need rescue. All right. We need to be rescued. We need to be set free. And only faith in Christ sets us free. So verse 24 through 26, it looks like. So then when the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be just justified by faith, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Well, that's just verse 25. Now the faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So the word guardian here is key to these verses. And Paul continues on with this picture until 29. So guardian in the Greek is pedagogos. And pedagogos were slaves that were in charge of the well-being of a child, like a babysitter bodyguard, all right? And so they were not the teachers, but they wanted, they wanted the immature child or they watched the immature child throughout the day and were responsible for their safety until the child was able to care for themselves. So kind of the idea that Nancy was giving, all right, that the law was kind of doing a the job there. So um, the immature child, they were watched by the pedagogues. And so Paul is saying that we were immature child, children, all right? Um, and so um, pedagogues was put in place to watch out for us, for our good. Um, but in verse 26 says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So I think Paul is expressing also a type of authority here for the believer by faith. All right, we see that happening throughout scripture that whenever sons of God comes out, 
Um, it, and there's a difference between them simply being a child, all right? So now they're, they're not just a child, they're an heir. Through faith, they are those who will now inherit. That's a different language from infant, child that needs a pedagogos, all right? Uh, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So this is not a verse to be used to prove text and argument salvation by baptism, all right? Paul is basically expressing here the idea of salvation and sonship by faith. He is not undoing this truth by replacing circumcision with baptism as a requirement, all right? Um, rather, for Paul, baptism is just a part of the reception of Christ. This is how you do it. You believe in our baptized. They're not to be separated, all right? It's part of belief, it's baptism. But if you find yourself coming to Christ in a desert and you die before you can reach water, I think you're fine, all right? You received Christ in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all right? Even if there's no water around, all right? All right, it's about Jesus. Go ahead, Marla. Uh, one pastor says that baptism is a public declaration of faith. Yeah, yes, it's a public declaration of faith, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, in the promotion of circumcision, we see that Judaizers offering a return to the law or identifying as a Jew in order to truly be spiritual. In the promotion of baptism, we see obedience to the very commands of Christ. All right. Well, it was, it's included in the Great Commission. It is the reception of Christ. All right. So you can't. And so this is, this is where I have some problem with people taking what Paul says in Galatians and going too far with it. All right. And they say, all I need to do is come to Christ as a five-year-old, and then I get to do whatever I want for the rest of my life. That's not what's going on here. That's not the faith that Paul ever, ever preached, all right? Um, coming to Christ and wanting nothing to do with actually following Christ cannot be true salvation. And that's not what Paul is advocating here, all right? If you, if you say you've come to Christ and you want nothing to, come to, nothing to do with Christ, then you haven't come to Christ. Those who come to Christ can't get enough of Christ. We want more of Christ, even in the face of our own failure. We want more of Jesus. All right. If you don't, if you, oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't want, you know, I don't want, I, you got to really check yourself and ask yourself, are you really his? If you want nothing to do with them, are you his? All right. To be Paul, to, or for Paul, is, I'm sorry, for Paul, it is self evident. If you are a Christian, you've been baptized, period. All right. There's not this big argument about it. It's just the way it is. So there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free. There's no male and female for all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. So he's still in this idea of pedagogos, right? That we are beyond that. We're, that's, no, that's what we were under the law. We were infants needing, needing the pedagogos, but we're not that. Now we're heirs. Isn't that awesome? I find that so amazing. We're, we're not that. Now we are co-heirs with Christ. And if you ever want to blow your mind, I want you to just spend some time in your prayer closet thinking about what it means to be a co-heir with Christ, an heir of God. That, man, your mind will get blown if you, if you, if you think about that and meditate on that in prayer, what that means. That is beyond anything we could ask or imagine or hope for. Go ahead. Um. I think it was in class Wednesday night. Um, someone made a reference to the fact that you know we had been slaves to sin, mm -hmm. but now we are slaves to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But we're not slaves to Him. He has adopted us mm -hmm. into the family as children, mm -hmm. and we have a different status than a slave. Well, Paul uses that language, so so that's probably what they're talking about. So, but he's not, Paul's not using it in a negative way. Right. He's talking about willingly, gladly being a servant of the Lord. Right. The bond servant, right? Mm -hmm. right. Bond servant, yeah. Then the bond servant is, is someone who in that time would, uh, I think I'm saying this right, but would, out of love for their master, dedicate their life to the service of their master. Yeah. All right. And so it's much different from the Western concept of slavery. Um, All right. Um, I think he says, or I don't even know if it's Paul, it could be Peter, but. The, uh, like if you came to Christ while you were a slave, you're now the Lord's free man. And if you came to the Lord when you were 
free, you're now Christ's slave. And so, I mean, it's, it's all of the above. Yeah. It's I'm, I'm yeah, free, I'm a son, yeah. but I'm also enslaved to Christ. I'm in, I used to be a slave to sin, but now I'm enslaved to righteousness, mm-hmm. which means whatever I do, there's this thing in me that pulls me back to righteousness, mm-hmm. where even if I do trip up in a sin, mm-hmm. there's conviction right there every yeah. time. Yeah. And That's I always true. have I'm always getting drawn back to righteousness, whereas before Christ, it was the opposite. I could, yeah. maybe I could do a good thing here and there, but, but my nature was always yeah, straight back to me, back to sin. Yeah. That's beautiful. All right. And we're, we are, we are stuck. We're under a curse. We can't help it until, <laughs> until we are made an heir. That's such one, such wonderful stuff. And anyway, um, let's go on to verse 28 and 29. Um, we just read that. Um, so verse 28 is widely misused and misunderstood here. It says there is no male or female, uh, nor slave, nor free. All are one in Christ Jesus. Paul is not advocating a sort of androgynous, culturalist persona, persona with no ethnicity. That's not what he's talking about. All right. I think what he is basically saying is that there is equality there. Because at the time, the custom was that the male was not the equal of the male. And so basically, he's putting them all the same thing. We have to wrestle with that, too, though, because I'm not going to advocate exactly that either, because Paul also puts establishes a godly order of things, um, husbands to wives and wives to husbands and, and things like that, too. So there's a difference that's going on there. You know, there's not one better than another, but there is a difference. And, and the Bible, I mean, in Revelation, we read about all the nations, all the tribes that have come and they don't they're not losing their distinctiveness. All right. Um, they're not losing their their gender you know um and so this is kind of the way this verse is used is it's weaponized right yeah. um this verse is weaponized and uh um it's not a, not a whitewashing of 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 the the of gender and and ethnicity and all those other things it's not just getting rid of all those things and re, and, and replacing it with the idea that those roles don't exist anymore they do uh, that unfortunately how is is how it's been weaponized. And, um, this verse is used most often by those who ignore the final two words of the verse. All right, we're all one. What in Christ Jesus? Yes. All right. It's all about Jesus. It's not about saying I'm just as good as you are. It's not, it's not about saying your status and your role doesn't mean anything. And that is mine. We get to do whatever we want. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's all about Jesus. And so Paul's point is not switching or combating the heresy of the Judaizers to, to now promote some homogenous agenda. All right. He's not switching context here. He's not switching message here. Here. All he's say, doing is giving them a level playing field in yes. the relationship with God. Mm-hmm. Not exactly. Not necessarily their customs, but in their relationship yeah. with God. It's all about the Lord. It's yes. about the Lord, all right? Uh, Paul's point, again, is not trying to make this weird idea of it out of that's out of context of what the rest of the passage. He's saying within the context of his correction, um, therefore, Paul's point is that Gentiles do not need to become Jews, all right? You're, you're a Gentile believer. And uh, if you are in Christ, you are in Christ because you have put your faith in Christ. Right. It's all about Jesus. You don't need that's what he's really dealing with. He's dealing with the still throughout this book, dealing with the heresy of the Judaizers. And he's saying, they're telling you you got to become a Jew. You don't. You don't need to become a Jew. You are in Christ because of your faith in Christ. It's, it's uni- unity, but not uniformity. All right. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to the promise, verse 29. So Paul will go on in chapter 4 to continue with his illustration that he began in 24 as he spoke about the law as pedagogos, guardian. No longer is the Christian, Jew, or Gentile under the watch of the law, under the curse of the law, under the imprisoning of the law. There are no longer little children or prisoners or cursed ones. Now in Christ, they are heirs. So this applies to both those under the Judaic law and the Gentiles who are under the law of conscience. So in Christ, we have been adopted as heirs into God's family. Christ, the son, now dwells in us, and we are no longer seen as enemies or strangers. 
Now we're family. We're God's family. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thought? Just closing, uh, I'm going to talk to you about one of the best days of my life. <laughs> was first best day was the day I came to know Christ, obviously. <laughs> Second best day was uh, marrying my wife. And something really close to that was the day our, our adoption with, with Isaac was finalized. I remember so clearly uh, standing before the judge, <laughs> get all choked up, <laughs> and holding my child. Um, and both Don and I wanted to hold him. <laughs> <laughs> and holding, holding Isaac and um, the judge saying, I think she ended up holding him. <laughs> the judge saying to us that in this, in the language of that, almost that we just read, that he is now our heir, and he is due all the rights and privileges, privileges thereof, and and uh, just and he said, just as if he was born of the flesh to you, and um, what an amazing day that was, and it was a joy. In so many ways. And the words, just as if he was born of the flesh to you, keep resonating in my mind that that's how God sees us. That the adoption price paid for us was the blood of Christ. And now, because of the blood of Christ applied to us, we are adopted into the family of God. Mm -hmm. And and all that God has, blows my mind, but all that God has is ours. (laughs) Uh Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you paid our adoption price. We could never pay it on our own. Before we even knew that you loved us, you loved us. Before we even knew our need, You paid for it. Thank you for that love, Lord. Thank you not just for setting us free from the law, but for making us your children. That by the Spirit we all cry, Abba, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.